So in terms of uh, young adults and whether they were get, uh, able to get the education uh, they desired and pursue their dreams, um, it was an important part of propaganda for both of the German states during the Cold War. Uh, in a lot of ways, the contest really was an ideological one about the future. So in West Germany, uh, at the end of the 1970s, young people started to worry about their futures quite a bit because they faced what was the re first real structural unemployment uh, in West Germany since the end of the war. That means that it wasn't just a blip of unemployment for young people, but this was something that was caused by a fundamental change in the economy. So it was probably there to stay. Uh, so that was very worrying for them. But also this happens alongside uh, the height, you could say, of left-wing terrorism. So the Red Army Fraction and others. Uh, there was also heightened awareness of environmental disaster, the destruction of the environment, which was another kind of existential threat to their futures. And uh, there was also um, a reheating of the Cold War itself, where nuclear missiles were going to be uh, put into Central Europe, into West Germany, which would make West Germany a target, uh, Central Europe a target, really, for uh, retaliatory missiles. So all these things led to a really pessimistic outlook, especially in the early 1980s. Uh, you hear two words in this time period, um, one of which is still used today. There's uh, Ellenbogengesellschaft, which is literally like the elbow society, which is indicating that people of the time felt that it was becoming more competitive and that you really had to elbow your way in to a career or to get the best opportunities. Uh, and the other one is the Berufsverbot, so being forbidden to pursue certain careers. Um, that was really, began in the 1970s, uh, and it was anyone in West Germany who was associated with an extremist group, a politically extreme group, uh, they were not allowed to have a job as a civil servant. And in Germany, still today, a lot of uh, jobs that you might not think are civil service jobs. So teachers, all teachers almost, uh, postal workers, railroad workers. Um, and to be associated with a potential terrorist group, you just had to maybe attend a protest or it, it varied in different, uh, different Bundesländer, right? Different states. Um, but it was uh, something that perhaps limited uh, free speech for, for young people in West Germany at this time. So uh, it's not exactly like what's happening in the GDR, but there are these um, threats, you could say, to uh, young people's futures. Now, in the GDR, the situation was, was very different. There was almost no unemployment. Uh, legally, you were required to have a job in the GDR. Um, and, but young people face different kinds of challenges, right? So here, there is a sort of unequal access to educational opportunities too, but it's based on your uh, family's political background. So if you came from a working class family, more opportunities would be open to you to say attend university. Now, who's working class is the question, right? Uh, for instance, Eric and Margot Honecker's kids like the leaders of the leader of the GDR uh, in the 70s and 80s, their kids were considered working class. So these categories are flexible and there's obviously uh, some inequality uh, of the normal sort, you could say. Um, so a lot of teens and young adults in the GDR, what they had to do in order to access the educational opportunities were to play by the rules. And what that meant was that they had to basically attend all of the uh, events and uh, you know, political campaigns and uh, recycling drives and everything that were run by the FDJ, which is the uh, youth organization of the GDR. They had to dress in a way that was clean and well put together and act relatively, you know, relatively like serious people. Uh, and they had to avoid things like obvious mentions of uh, Western television and radio programs. So teachers had a lot of power in this instance. The teachers, uh, who were of course appointed by the state, 
could determine whether or not a student was allowed to go on for, for higher education. So you had to kind of show them that you were a serious person and committed to socialism in order to get those opportunities. So a lot of young people who, for instance, didn't want to play by those rules, what they ended up doing, they got channeled towards apprenticeships of certain types. And they would, for instance, be channeled into an apprenticeship uh, as a tractor mechanic or as a pig farmer. Um, maybe these are extreme examples, but the point is that they didn't always get to choose. Certainly they weren't their, their first choice careers. And what would happen is a lot of times young people would uh, complete that apprenticeship, they would finish it. Uh, because they had to, but then they would pursue a degree in theology, which was one of the only avenues open to uh, people who were at all kind of alternative, right, who didn't fit in or who were politically active outside of the sanctioned uh, uh, activities of the state. So you end up with a lot of uh, theology degree holders, and this is one reason why later in the 1980s, the churches, the evangelical churches, become uh, a shelter for the uh, opposition movement and for a lot of unsanctioned uh, youth cultural movements like punk or um, hip hop to some extent. So 